What's going on guys, JP is back for another video and today we're going to be reacting to Why American Cities Are Broke, The Growth Ponzi Scheme. This video comes from Not Just Bikes and the last video I posted on this channel also comes from the same channel. That video is titled European vs. American Suburbs and it was in that video that I got a really good glimpse of what suburbs can be like in Europe. Uh, the video was showcasing a suburb in Germany. I was just shocked by the suburb's proximity to public transportation, restaurants, and how it resembled the look of a city when it was really just a suburb. Because as you guys know, the suburbs in the United States can be very sprawling, desolate, and lacking any type of public infrastructure aside from the road. So today we're going to be reacting to why American cities are broke. This is kind of a follow-up on last week's video, so if you want to watch that, uh, give that one a go. But I'm really excited to get into this because the growth Ponzi scheme is something that was referenced, but something that I don't really know about. I looked it up a bit, um, kind of similar to a pyramid scheme, but there are some key differences. I'm not really sure. Let's just get right into it. Hit that like button, hit subscribe, and let's get it. Welcome to the third video in my Strong Town series. If you have no idea what Strong Towns is about, you might want to watch the first two videos, but it's not strictly necessary. American cities are famous for car-dependent sprawl. That's probably one of the first things most people associate with America after apple pie, baseball, and driving in soul-crushing traffic. But this wasn't always the case. American cities don't have to be sprawling just because the country itself is big. And up until the Second World War, they weren't. They were just as compact as cities found almost anywhere else. But after the 1940s, America started on a totally different pattern of development and began their great suburban experiment. But herein lies the problem, because this American pattern of development builds places that do not financially support themselves. And the only reason they're still there is because American cities are a Ponzi scheme. If you don't know what a Ponzi scheme is, there are many videos on YouTube, but the very quick explanation is as follows. A scammer offers an imaginary investment opportunity, offering a huge return on investment. Investor A comes along and invests. Now, the scammer doesn't actually have the money to pay investor A if he wants his money out, so he takes on another investor B. He uses the money from investor B to pay investor A, pocketing a little for himself, of course. But how does he pay investor B? Easy. He just brings on investors C, D, E, and so on. Hmm. This works out great for our scammer, but the moment that growth stops, he has a very big problem. In the end, all Ponzi schemes fail. It's just a matter of when. One of the key insights of strong towns is that the way that US and Canadian cities have been built since World War II follows exactly this model. American-style suburbia is dependent on growth to stay financially solvent. The moment these cities stop growing, because of a financial crisis, a radical change in the job market, or any one of a number of other factors, everything starts to fall apart. Strong Towns calls this the growth Ponzi scheme. Now, unlike financial fraud, the generation who started this process didn't do it intentionally. After World War II, America was a prosperous country and with low-cost automobiles available, it seemed possible that every American could own their own house, on their own piece of land, and the American dream was born. This became so central to American psychology that the idea that suburban development provides prosperity is taken as fact by almost everyone in the country. And the same goes for Canada, too. Part of the problem is how suburban growth is financed. When the suburbs began, huge amounts of money from federal and state governments were given to cities to build out their suburbs. This still goes on today. For example, when a city wants to build a new road or freeway, usually less than a quarter of the funding comes from the city itself. The overwhelming majority comes from the Department of Transportation and other higher levels of government. So cities don't have to pay very much to build new infrastructure, but they do get a big influx of tax revenue from the new developments that spring up. This brings us to the first problem. It encourages cities to build lots of new developments, even if they don't make any financial sense. Of course, all this new cheap infrastructure comes with a very important catch. The city may get it built for cheap, but the city is ultimately responsible for paying to maintain that infrastructure forever. On the surface, Ooh. this is fine. 
governments want to invest in their cities because they are the engines of economic growth. And for the city, this should be fine too. They collect taxes from the new developments that spring up around that infrastructure, and those taxes go towards future maintenance. The big problem begins if there isn't enough tax revenue collected to cover the replacement cost of the infrastructure. And that is exactly what has happened with car-dependent suburbia, because car-centric sprawl is horrendously expensive. To explain this problem further, I'll use the example of a quote, ideal development that is often used as an example by strong towns. Imagine a new suburban housing development on the edge of town. In this case, the developer completely pays for the street and turns it over to the city for maintenance. The residents move in and start paying tax revenue. This couldn't get any better for the suburban municipality. Free development, free road, a bunch of new tax revenue, this is awesome. Now the municipality in this case would put a little bit of money aside for the maintenance of that road. So what would this look like in an American suburb? Well at first, streets don't need a lot of maintenance. They may require some minor repairs such as filling cracks, but in general, new streets are pretty cheap. So the suburban city's cash flow looks something like this. Everything looks pretty great until the end of the street's life cycle, because eventually all streets and roads need resurfacing. Oh. So suddenly, the graph goes like this. Oh. If the city were just this one street, it would already be bankrupt. But cities aren't just one street. They're made up of hundreds of streets and individual developments. So assuming a new development every other year, a real growing city's cash flow would look something like this, with new developments covering the cost of past developments. As okay. you can see... Yeah, so they're dying, but not because of... Oh my god. It makes sense. I had to just understand that, but wow. I get it. So I guess technically it's a pun like how will this end is I guess my point. Are we ever going to run out of space? I don't know. E growth covers the problem and the city is financially solvent again. Yay, this is great. Let's build more. Lots of <laughs> asphalt and free parking for everyone. But when you get a couple of generations into the suburban experiment, the maintenance obligations of the past start to catch up with you. Suddenly, your suburb's finances start to look something like this. Oh. Because when you lose money on every development, you don't make it up in volume. Now, it's important to note that this is an ideal case, as this model assumes near constant growth. In reality, cities have phases of growth and phases of decline, and this situation is made even worse because these growing infrastructure liabilities tend to show up just as a period of growth is over. Many Americans yeah. like to brush this off by claiming that cities do actually collect enough tax revenue, but it's all lost to corruption or inefficiencies or unions or whatever. <laughs> that just sounds so, so American. Like, no one really knows where the tax money is going, and uh, people feel like they don't really have control over their taxes. So they kind of chalk it up to you know, the opposing party or the whatever, whoever's spending it is just, yeah, like you said, corrupt. There's all types of things like that. That's so true. I hadn't even really thought about that. But the reality is that most American suburbs collect only a fraction of the tax revenue required to actually finance their sprawling infrastructure. Strong Towns has several case studies about this, such as this example of a suburban road that needed resurfacing. In order for the residents to cover just the cost of their own road, the city would need an immediate 46% increase in property tax. And there are so many other costs to a city beyond just roads, such as sewer and water systems, sidewalks, treatment systems, pumps, water towers, stormwater ponds as well as all the operational costs of running a city, such as police or fire departments. You can't just brush this off by waving your hands in the air and saying, The efficiencies, the efficiencies, the efficiencies, the efficiencies. Sorry, worst case scenario, you have no problem with parking taxes? No, it's efficiency. I'll link to this and other cases by Strong Towns in the description. And Canada is not much better. An analysis done by the Halifax Regional Municipality found that the cost to maintain and service an urban home are well less than half that of a suburban home. 
but in most North American cities, the suburban home pays less property tax. This leads to an effective subsidy for car-dependent suburbia. Now, don't get me wrong, our cities need affordable housing. But the solution is not to subsidize the least efficient, least sustainable developments in the city. But that topic deserves a lot more explanation, so I'll talk about that in more detail in a future video. So it's clear... You know what's funny? Like, this video doesn't even look like an American suburb because of how close, is the, house, the, cl how close the houses are to each other. <laughs> I was like, no, this... But, yeah. Oh, I'll talk about suburbs are not financially sustainable. The amount of tax... It's clear that car-dependent suburbs are not financially sustainable. The amount of tax revenue collected by the suburb does not cover the replacement cost of its infrastructure. And so suburban cities become addicted to growth any kind of growth, even second-rate taco joints, just to bring in enough tax revenue to cover their maintenance obligations. But we've had several generations of this suburban garbage, several life cycles of road, water, and sewer replacements. But somehow, suburbia is still there. So you might be asking yourself, how are car-dependent suburbs still around? Why is this still a thing, and what has kept it afloat all these years? Well, the answer is debt. Lots and lots and lots of debt. But I'll explore that in the next episode of this series on Strong Towns. I'd like to thank my support. I really want to look into debt uh, more because the U.S. is in what? Like trillion, trillion, billion, blah, 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 dollars of debt. Like I keep seeing that number and I, I stopped paying attention to it because I don't really understand it. But what does that really mean? Like we're in that debt. When do we owe it? What happens if we can't pay that? Like, blah, 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 you know? And I feel like a lot of countries are in debt, but I just want to look into that and understand it. Because people say that, but what does that really mean? <laughs> I get it, we're in debt, but what does that mean for us? So, why American cities are broke, the growth Ponzi scheme. I mean, this is just... <laughs> If you look at the suburbs, like, you can kind of see that it's probably not the best idea. Like, I don't think I needed the growth Ponzi scheme to tell me that. But it was interesting to look into this some more and see, I guess, how these suburbs are sustainable and continue to be built. Um, it's just very unfortunate. And like he was saying, the second... Uh, I don't know if he said secondhand taco joint or whatever, but it is very true. Like, if you look at, man, just look at this, for example. Like, all these are chains. AutoZone, Sherwin-Williams. I'm surprised they don't see the Golden Arches anywhere. But there's probably a Taco Bell or something. And that's true. They bring into these uh, suburbs, like, all these chains and restaurants with, you know, not much of an identity. They're kind of just commercialized versions of a genre of food of a type of food like it's it's not really good food and not really good for you either but they're everywhere and create a uniform look no matter which suburb you're in which state you're in so a bit of a sad video honestly and uh yeah <laughs> hopefully we can break out of this sometime soon because i don't think it's the future is not really in the suburbs like eventually they're gonna crash like every ponzi scheme has to crash at some point so let me know what you guys thought about this video in the comments down below if you enjoyed it hit the like button hit subscribe and i will see you all in the next one peace